Okay, at this time we're moving on to our main talk. Um, it's going to be... I, ah, there. <laughs> uh, Eric Anderson, our uh, uh, board uh, president of Houston Oasis and also a member of the network of Oasis. Um, will be talking to us about the wonderfully caring and very healthy U.S. healthcare system. <laughs> Thank you, Brina, for that introduction. Uh, looks like today I'm going to be talking to you about selecting a location for your network. <laughs> oh, that's right. Okay, we're going to be talking about the unhealthy and uncaring American healthcare system. I've got to give you a full disclaimer. I can see that some of our medical professionals in the group are actually sitting here in the front row. I can't see any rotted fruit or anything, so I'm probably safe there. But this talk is not going to be critical of anyone that works in medicine. It's not going to be critical of medicine at all, actually. I'm a huge advocate of Western medicine, and I think that uh, medicine and healthcare are inherently good things. What I'm going to be talking about instead is the economics behind our exceptional healthcare system, which is where my title comes from The Unhealthy and Uncaring American Healthcare System. Uh, it's a very good title. You can tell it's a great title because I didn't come up with it. I stole it from Walter Cronkite, who, 17 years ago in 1999, famously said, America's healthcare system is neither healthy, caring, nor a system. <laughs> he was right back then, 17 years later, he's still right today, believe me. So why did I get interested in healthcare? Uh, it's not my profession, I'm actually a financial analyst. Um, but I became interested in it in 2012 when my first child was born, Preston. Many of you know him. Um, and after his birth, about a month and a half after his birth, it was a relatively uncomplicated pregnancy. Everything was pretty routine. Um, I started getting bills in the mail, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And um, it was a lot of bills. It was not just a bill from the hospital or a bill from the doctor. It was a bill from the surgeon, the surgeon's assistant, and the anesthesiologist, and everybody who waved and said hello to me at the hospital was <laughs> sending me a bill. And I totaled up all these bills, and it was $6,000. And I thought, wait a minute, I've got good insurance. I look at the back of my card, it says maximum out of pocket per year, $2,000. How do we end up with $6,000? So I called everyone and I explained to them, it must be some mistake. I've got good insurance. Why am I paying $6,000? And all of them said, oh no, sir, there's no mistake. By the way, if you don't pay us, we're going to send you to collections and destroy your credit. So I paid it. I paid the $6,000. It was worth it. I would have paid more than that. But, still, it's a lot of money to pay for something that humans have been doing since the beginning of time. <laughs> now, I called my dad and I asked him for advice. Uh, you know, my dad's done this whole pregnancy thing four times and I thought maybe he knew what I could do uh, to better my situation here. And I said, Dad, you know what? Man, you had four kids. What did you do, right? And you got all these medical bills. How did you plan for it? How do you save for it? How do you know what's, what's right and what's wrong? And he said, Psh, beats me. When you were born in 1988, which was 24 years ago at the time I was asking him, I paid a $10 copay. That's it. <laughs> and I talked to other people, okay? It wasn't just that my dad had really good insurance, all right? Other people around that time period were paying about the same thing. So something changed in the 24 years between 1988 and 2012. Something has changed about our healthcare system. What is it? So I started looking at it. Turns out, Drum roll. You'll all be very surprised to hear the cost of health care has gone up. Wow, who would have thought that? But it's gone up more than inflation, right? Most things go up. Inflation is the, uh, is the kind of the, uh, the normal rate at which things increased in cost. Usually wages increase to compensate for it, so it's kind of an invisible effect. Let's look at a couple of different things and how they were affected by inflation between 1984 and 2015. All right, first one I want to look at is housing. I've talked about housing before. We're all very familiar with it. Um, Housing in 2008 was in a bubble. When the bubble burst, it caused the global economy to fall to its knees, right? We're all familiar with this. It's called the financial crisis. And something interesting about housing is when we look at wages, housing and wages move in very close synchronous to each other. By the way, all these graphs are inflation adjusted. So we, we have taken inflation out of the equation. We are just looking at the raw cost increase above inflation. You'll notice that housing and wages move together in costs, which makes sense, right? How, are you, how is the house going to go up in value if it's consuming an increasing portion of our wages, right? Until 2000, when it moves into a bubble, it hits 2008, then it all comes crashing down, and uh, well, recently it started going up more than wages again. This talk is not about that, but if you want a couple of reasons behind that, uh, interest rates have been near zero for about a decade now. 
and there's been an influx of uh, foreign investment dollars as bonds aren't paying anything. But that's for discussion on another time. <laughs> also notice that wages since 1984 really haven't moved at all on an inflation adjusted basis. That's also a discussion for another time, not a very good thing. But let's look at the cost of health care now compared to these two metrics. Whoa! That's gone up way more than the cost of housing. Even the cost of housing, when it was in a complete bubble, the cost of health care is growing much, much faster than inflation, and it's growing much, much faster than our wages are going, which begs the question, if it keeps growing faster than our wages are going, how the hell are we supposed to pay for it? It's consuming an ever-increasing portion of the American budget. There's more than one way to look at the increasing cost of health care, of course. Let's look at the cost of health care compared to the rest of the world. Is the cost of health care going up everywhere else, perhaps? Well, another way to measure this is to look at the health care sector as a proportion of our GDP. What is GDP? It is all the transactions of goods and services in the economy generally measured on a quarterly basis, right? Every single dollar and cent that is transacted for every single product or service measures into your total GDP. In the entire world between 1995 and 2015, healthcare moved from consuming about 9% of GDP to today consuming about 10% of GDP. So it has gone up in cost, but then again, you know, also medical technology has improved. So maybe we're getting a pretty good deal on that. Let's look at what has happened to US healthcare as a percentage of GDP. A little bit more. Look at that. In 1995, we were paying about 13% of our GDP. 13% of every single transaction in the U.S. was healthcare related dollar for dollar. To today, we are paying close to 18% of our GDP. Mind you, we are the largest economy on earth. 18% of our entire economy is going towards healthcare services. Now that number sounds even more ridiculous when you realize that even with our spending of 18% of our GDP, we still have a significant portion of our population that doesn't have access to basic health care. How pathetic is that? All right, here's my favorite graph by far. Here we have on the x-axis, health expenditure, inflation adjusted. And you'll notice that we have bullet pointed through time where we stand on these two axes per country, right? And then on the y-axis, we have life expectancy. So what we're trying to measure here is approximate value. How much are we paying for health care? How much are we getting back in return compared to the rest of the world? Now, there's a lot of different valuation metrics you could use besides life expectancy, but this is a very simple metric that is easily tracked by countries all over the world. I guarantee you this chart matches if we were to swap that out with other things like infant mortality rate and survivability of certain cancers. The obvious outlier here is the United States, who you can see is paying more than anyone else in the industrialized world per capita for their health care and is receiving less than anyone else in the industrialized world for their health care in terms of life expectancy. Now, I want you to make a mental note for me of where Japan, Australia, and New Zealand are. They're about center of the pack. Japan's up at the top, right below them, Australia, right below them, New Zealand. We're going to talk about them. All right, so let's talk about some of the reasons, possible reasons, why healthcare has gone up and why those reasons are invalid. So the first one is, there have been massive improvements in medicine and technology over the last three decades, and that makes it more expensive, right? We're getting more out of it, you have to put a little bit more into it. Well, that reason doesn't really stand up because medical technology across the Western world is relatively homogenous, all right? They got MRI machines in France too, I promise you, okay? We may have certain innovations and expertise that others don't, but others have certain innovations and expertise that we don't, and generally everything in medicine is shared and published in journals, right? And then also, I mean, the graph we were just looking at tells the story. The U.S. ranks poorly in comparative metrics of life expectancy, infant mortality, et cetera, et cetera. So it must not be true, or we must not be getting our money's worth if the reason for the increase in healthcare costs is just in the US or because of improvements in medical technology. All right, another possible reason. Health effects from changing lifestyles. Maybe we're eating too much money to eat. You know, maybe, maybe we have some kind of an obesity epidemic, right? I mean, we've all heard this. America is a very obese, on average nation. Maybe that's what's causing our healthcare costs to be so high. 
Well, actually, remember where Australia and New Zealand were? Both of them have similar obesity rates in the United States, and yet they have higher life expectancies, and they are not paying nearly as much as we are for our health care, so we can dismiss that. All right, what about this? It's got to be tobacco, right? All those filthy, dirty smokers sucking their lungs full of tar. They've got to be the ones putting all this extra strain on their health care system, causing it to be so expensive for us. No, sorry, that's not it either. In fact, the U.S. ranks better than most industrialized nations in the world when it comes to tobacco consumption per capita. We have really been a world leader in leading the fight against smoking. So it can't be that. Oh, I know what it is. It's got to be our aging population, right? We've heard this on the news. The baby boomers, one of the biggest generations, they're getting older and older, and as people get older, they generally consume more health care. So wouldn't that increase the cost? That's true. As people age, they consume a lot more health care. But the U.S. has a smaller proportion of elderly than most other industrialized nations, especially countries like Japan, which has a huge proportion of elderly citizens in their health care system. And yet, they all manage to have a higher life expectancy and a lower cost. So what is it? Well, in brief, it is our health care system itself. Many people refer to it as a free market system. That's not right. It's not actually a free market system. It's a perversion of a free market system. But let's just for the sake of argument assume that it was a free market system. Now, I need to disclaim, as many of you know, I am unapologetically capitalist. I believe in the free market system. And I believe in that system because I know that capitalism has created more value, pulled more people out of poverty, and created more wealth than any other economic system tried on Earth. I also admit that capitalism cannot be universally applied to any market and expect to get the same results. Capitalism, remember, is an indifferent system. It is neither moral nor immoral. It doesn't care. It just asks one question, and it does it very well. What is the price? And it answers it. All right, so before I get into healthcare and capitalism, let's talk about how capitalism works when it's supposed to be working. Let's talk about the market for ding ding bicycles, okay? All right, in the market for bicycles, this is a very common graph you'll see uh, when we're talking about economics. A lot of people use this. This is the relationship between the price of a good, in this case a bike, bicycle, and the quantity of goods that are produced in the marketplace. All right, so we've got two lines there. The first one is the demand curve for bicycles. Uh, this would be how consumers react to a change in price for bicycles. Obviously, the demand curve is going to slope like this, right? As bikes get more expensive, consumers are going to want less of them. The fact that that line is sloped means consumers have bargaining powers. All right? If the bike gets too expensive, we can go buy rollerblades. All right? The other curve is the supply curve. It's the people producing bicycles. And it's sloped the opposite way because as the price of a bicycle increases, Producers want to produce more of it. It makes more resources available for the production of bicycles. So how do we solve this problem of consumers wanting bicycles and suppliers wanting to supply bicycles? How do we find the perfect price? Well, we look at the equilibrium, the intersection of where the supply and demand curves meet, and we find our perfect price that makes our cyclists just so happy. I'm glad to see Bradley's not here today. We should ask him permission for this later. <laughs> The key to this chart that I want you to take away from this example is that when producers and consumers have bargaining power, capitalism works. All right, now let's talk about healthcare. Right? Capitalism, it's very good at answering one question, what is the price? The question we end up asking indirectly when we apply capitalism to healthcare is what is the price of your life? Okay? The supply curve hasn't changed. Healthcare producers can still produce and provide more health care, or they can provide less health care and another price. But the demand curve has changed. There's no more elasticity in it. Consumers don't have bargaining power. If anybody in here has a heart attack, are you going to shop hospitals? Are you just going to call 911 and get help? All right? You don't have bargaining power. Nobody can tell you otherwise. Which means that in a capitalistic free market healthcare system, the suppliers of healthcare hold all the power to control price. All they have to do is adjust the supply, raise the price as high as they want to. All right, I said earlier our healthcare system is not a perfect free market system, it's a perversion of capitalism, and there are several reasons why that is. First of all, there is almost no price transparency in our system. 
You want to know what a hip replacement costs? You want to know what it's going to cost to have a child? You want to know what anything is going to cost? Good luck calling all the providers trying to figure this out. Like most of us, we have insurance. And we assume that the rate the insurance company has negotiated for us is fair. And if it's not, we're on the hook anyways. Also, thanks to the nature of healthcare, there is a lack of competition for rate providers. Nobody's trying to undercut each other. Nobody's trying to steal patients. They all know that we all need healthcare. We're going to come to them no matter what. And there's very little information to convey quality of healthcare. It's very hard to find out who is the best hip replacement surgeon, where is the best place to have the baby. These qualitative metrics, they're out there, but they're a little bit opaque and they're kind of hard to discover, which impedes our abilities as consumers to be informed and to make informed decisions. Finally, by the nature of medicine, medicine's very complicated. It requires many, many years of study to understand it. And all of us don't have that training like doctors do. So at the end of the day, we just don't know what we need. We rely on the expertise of our medical professionals to tell us what we need, which as consumers makes us unable to bargain, unable to make sure we're getting what is right for us. All right, the biggest perversion of the medical system by far, though, is the intermediary that we have on insurance. For most people in this country who have insurance, your insurance isn't paid for by you out of pocket, it's paid for by your employer as a part of your total compensation. So here's the relationship, right? Consumers, we receive services, medical services, from our medical providers, hospitals, doctors, surgeons. Premiums are paid from the consumer or more likely from your employer to the insurer. And the provider receives reimbursement from the insurer, maybe a little piece from you, a copay or deductible or something. But a majority of the money is transferring from the consumer to the insurer to the provider. We're separating consumers from the knowledge of what their healthcare <coughs> consumption is doing and what it costs. So what are everybody's incentives in this system? Consumers, all they want is to get the best possible treatment and the maximum service. They're paid into their insurance and they want the best. Nobody got cancer and said, I want the second best doctor. <laughs> I want the third best oncologist. No, we want the best. We paid our insurance. We're entitled to it. The insurer, well, they're businesses, they're here to make money, and they're making money on the spread. The spread between what they receive in premiums and what they pay out into the provider. So their incentive is to keep that spread as wide as possible. And the providers, we, this is a bill for payment, or this is a bill per service system, right? They are incentivized, I'm not saying they're bad people, I'm saying they're human beings, to bill for the maximum service and to receive the maximum reimbursement. No one in this whole system is incentivized to control costs. So what naturally happens when nobody is incentivized to keep the costs down? They go up. It just makes sense. So, as you can imagine, understanding um, the relationship between the players and the healthcare system, there is a lot of incentive for things to be wasteful. There's a lot of wasteful spending in our healthcare system. And uh, a study done in 2012 by PricewaterhouseCooper examined all the relationships between all the different medical providers, and they looked at all the different statements and interviewed thousands of people and, and comprehensively put together a report on the healthcare system where they found that more than 50% of all healthcare spending in this country is considered wasteful. And for purposes of this presentation and for the purposes of this finding, we will define wasteful spending as spending for a service or a good which provides no value to the patient. Think about that. 50% of every single dollar transacted in the healthcare system is wasteful spending. A test that was run that maybe didn't need to be run, a medication that was prescribed that perhaps didn't need to be prescribed. All right, there's another incentive too. You know, maybe doctors are very liable to be sued if something goes wrong. And so they have an incentive right there to make sure that they catch everything, that they run every test, they perform every procedure necessary to cover themselves from a lawsuit should they miss something. What's more frustrating than wasteful spending is fraudulent spending. And there's plenty of that too in the healthcare system. A survey, also done by PricewaterhouseCooper, found that 90% of all medical bills issued contain errors. 90%. I don't know what other industry on earth could get away with 90% mistakes. Things like upcoding, upcharging. There's something called a CPT code. Most providers use them. They're established by the American Medical Association. I believe they're required by HIPAA. It's 
So anytime they bill for something, be it a Band-Aid or a surgery, they have to use the appropriate CPT code. But there's a lot of CPT codes out there. Upcharging is when they use this, the most expensive code in the category. Let me give you an example. Perhaps you have a C-section, all right? There's a lot of different CPT codes for C-section. It could be a routine scheduled C-section without any complication. There's a code for that. It could be a C-section that was done in an emergency where there's more attention required from doctors or maybe a specialized surgeon needs to come in. There's a CPT code for that too. And that CPT code reimburses higher because of the extra risk. It should. But what's happening here is the billing is not necessarily reflecting what should be charged on the bill in many, many cases. Then there's double bill. Like I said, you get a lot of bills after you go to a hospital, okay, from a lot of different people. More than one of those parties could be claiming the same CPT code, and you might not know it unless you specifically request from all of your providers to send you CPT codes for that procedure so you can check for this. Your insurance company isn't going to check for it. They do some high-level checks. If it's a really expensive bill, they might bring someone in to look at it. But that responsibility is on you to find this kind of stuff. They also might just flat out charge for a service that wasn't performed, right? They charge it for two band-aids instead of one. There's an extra $6,000. <laughs> Incorrect time charges. CPT codes billed in 15 minutes increments, all right? So operating room time, the time you spend in the operating room, they have to bill a CPT code for every single 15 minute increment that you're in the operating room. And maybe they say it was an hour instead of 45 minutes. And then there's the most frustrating one, the one that I have personally dealt with so much in my own experience, overpayment, which is when your healthcare provider asks you to prepay in front of the procedure a certain amount based on what they believe your deductible and coinsurance requirement is going to be. And then after it all happens and gets processed through the insurance, there's money left over that should be given to you, but they never bother to get that statement out to you. So you never know about it unless you reconcile it yourself, which is exactly what I did. <laughs> I, uh, I've got a new member of the family, Fallon. I'm sure a lot of you have met him. And uh, not unlike when Preston was born, I got a bunch of bills in the mail about a month and a half afterwards from a bunch of different people. And so this time, instead of just blindly paying them, I called every single one of my wives. I said, send me the CPT codes. And I created a spreadsheet where I reconciled my insurance benefits against what I was being charged to make sure that everything was on the up and up. I found that in almost every single case there was a mistake. I, uh, you can see the, uh, the total here. I was initially billed for $5,865.80 from a bunch of different providers. And after I examined the bills and corrected the mistakes, I ended up owing $1,560.87. There was $4,500 in out-of-pocket expenses there. It was free money. <laughs> um, I'm not going to go into detail about all the mistakes I caught. I'm just going to share a couple of my favorites. Uh, the first favorite has to be from my insurance company. Um, my insurance has a $500 individual deductible, which means that each member of my family has their own $500 deductible that must first be met before the coinsurance kicks in, which is the insurance obligation on behalf of the bill. In my case, the insurance pays 90%, I pay 10% for the co-insurance. It's actually a pretty good plan. But when I totaled up all the deductibles and reconciled the bills, I found that I was being charged $1,500 in deductible. But I should have only been charged $1,000, right? Because there's my wife's deductible and there's Fallon's deductible. 500 plus 500, 1,000. Instead, it was 1,500. I called and I asked and I demanded to be transferred to a supervisor and no one could answer my question or they wouldn't answer my question. Until finally, I went through all that big stack of paperwork on my own, and I discovered that they were billing my wife's C-section to me so they could use my deductible. Eric Anderson was being billed for a cesarean section. <laughs> <laughs> and this was entirely the insurance company's doing, because the hospital bills had it straight. They had it all billed to Jess. I wasn't a part of it. The insurance company took those bills and changed the patient to Eric Anderson so they could use an extra deductible. It was unbelievable, and when I called them, oh, Mr. Anderson, we were so sorry. What a mistake! Can you believe we did that? <laughs> That's bullshit. I can smell that on my way, okay? The second one was a prepayment we had made to Jess's OBGYN. They had collected $650 in advance for the procedure, and then, interestingly enough, a month and a half after it, I didn't get any statement from them. 
So I called them and asked them to send me our records, and they did. And sure enough, I found that there was $350 that belonged to me because the insurance had only billed $300, and I paid them $650. And after calling and screaming and emailing and threatening to sue, they finally reimbursed me the $350. <laughs> All right. What did I say? I said, wasteful spending's bad, fraudulent spending's worse. What's worse than fraudulent spending? Assholes. I mean, patent monopolies. <laughs> Legal, really, really dishonest behavior, collusive behavior from people who just flat out you don't like. All right, so I've got an example here. This is Mr. Martin Scarelli winner of the 2015 Most Punchable Face Award. <laughs> Most of you recognize him. Martin Scarelli's not a doctor, he's not, uh, he's not a scientist, he doesn't know chemistry, he's not adding anything of any value to the medical system. What he is is a capitalist, all right? An inmate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, what's funny about that? Yeah, he's an inmate, but not for this. This was totally legal. He's an inmate for stealing investor money and an unrelated thing. All right, so what he did is he bought the rights to a drug, a patented drug, I think it was Daraprim, is that right? It's for AIDS. Yeah, it, 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 was, it was an AIDS medication. I think the drug was called Daraprim. It's an anti-parasitic. Whatever it was, it was a life-saving drug. He bought the rights to it, he added nothing of value, and he increased the price. 4,000%. 4,000% for this drug, right? And all that happened as a result of this, because all that could happen, because it's perfectly legal, we give these people legal monopolies with patents. All that happened is Congress hauled them in front so that a bunch of politicians could act like they were going to do something about it, but really they couldn't. What he's doing was perfectly legal. Even... Oh, did they? No, but we're one of the few countries that doesn't have caps on prices for things like that. Yes, and it, it, I, I may be misinformed, but I believe that we still don't have any caps on it. His being pulled in front of Congress, so far, has done nothing for us, but make a bunch of politicians look like they're tough on health care. Right? All right. So even when there isn't a patent, uh, drug companies can use techniques like evergreening. Evergreening is when a drug reaches the end of its useful patent, I believe it's 15 years, maybe 14 years, they change something about the chemical formula, something perhaps insignificant, but enough that they can file a new patent and go for another 15 years and evergreen the drug and keep selling it under the same name and the same label. Also, drug companies use something called drug coupons, which on the surface sound like a very good thing, but they're not actually a good thing for the healthcare system. So if you are a consumer and you go to the pharmacy and you have a choice between a name brand drug and a generic drug, you're probably gonna pick the generic drug because it's cheaper. Oh, but wait, sir, Pfizer has given you this coupon out of the goodness of their hearts, <laughs> which is gonna pay your entire co-insurance on that name brand drug. Oh, great, I'll take the name brand then, right? The name brand's always better. Duracell's better than CVS and you know, whatever, right? You get the name brand, but your insurance company still has to pay the price for the name brand, so that savings that you got just gets kicked right back into the insurance system in the form of higher premiums, and the price keeps going up, and Pfizer keeps making money on their name brand drug when there's a generic out there. And then there's also something which isn't legal, but it's very, very suspicious because a lot of it's been going on, and that's collusive behavior between drug companies, which we're going to talk about in a bit. All right, collusive behavior. This is another star of the healthcare system, I'm sure everybody knows. Uh, the CEO of Mylan, who purchased the rights to the EpiPen, the shot of epinephrine, and increased the price from $100 a pen to $600 a pen, because they had patented a new delivery method and gotten a patent on that, and everybody else who wanted to sell epinephrine pens, which were not patented, hit roadblocks when they reached the FDA, because the FDA was concerned, perhaps rightfully so, that the generics could cause confusion among consumers when they're using epinephrine pens. Since 2010, I want to talk about insulin now, that's enough about her. I want to talk about insulin. Since 2010 to 2015, the price of insulin, which does not have a patent on it, has increased 325%. Insulin was first synthesized in 1921, almost 100 years ago. There's no secret to how insulin is synthesized. All right, there's no, there's no magical formula to creating it, but it is a necessary life-saving drug that diabetics have to use on a daily, perhaps many times a day basis. So, talking about collusive behavior, how could something like that happen when there's no patent on it? There are three manufacturers of insulin in the United States. All three of them, at the same time, raised their prices over the last 
last five years. How does that happen? If two of them raise their prices and one of them doesn't, everybody switches to the third one and keeps all the business. If one of them raises their prices, they lose all their customers. It takes all three in synchronous to raise their prices in order to make this plan work. Tell me there's not collusion going on here. Tell me they're not working for their mutually beneficial interest. Yet, the Federal Trade Commission has not brought a single case against them. There are some concerning changes going on in healthcare right now. Traditional health insurance, many people call it Cadillac health insurance, the type of health insurance where you go to your doctor and you pay a $10 copay instead of paying them $200 and getting that applied to your deductible, is going out of favor. As the cost of health insurance has been increasing, as the cycle has grown to the point of where premiums are so cost exclusive, a cheaper alternative is being used called high deductible insurance plans. Now, high deductible insurance can be fine, but you as a consumer are on the hook until your deductible is met. There's no co-pays. You have to pay 100% until you meet your deductible. And the reason why that concerns me is because 60% of bankruptcies in this country are already related to health care debt. 60% of bankruptcies. And if we push further costs of health care onto our citizens, how do we expect them to cope with it? Another big concerning fact of the proliferation of high deductible insurance plans is that, frankly, the medical system has grown fat off of traditional insurance. It is not as efficient as it needs to be. I've examined the profit margins of the largest publicly traded hospital companies, and I tell you, they're lucky to break even on many quarters. If they suddenly lose this benefit, we could be talking about a recession, a medical recession. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but if these trends continue, there's absolutely a possibility. All right. Some brief conclusions. Obviously, America needs a sustainable health care system that has a mechanism for cost control built into it. We don't have that right now. There is no cost control. Nobody's incentivized to control costs. Be that regulation that mandates maximum caps on things, be that a entirely socialistic health care system where the costs are mandated, where everyone in the system is paid a flat price, or maybe a Medicare style system where the cost of reimbursement for things are paid for, but the hospitals and doctors are still private workers. I don't know. But whatever the system is, it absolutely needs to have a price control mechanism built into it. But we're just going to keep the costs rising and rising and rising. Also, I think medicine needs to be further regulated. And I'm not talking about the practice of medicine. I'm not talking about the certification of doctors or healthcare professionals. I'm talking about medical billing needs to be regulated. As a consumer, when I spot something wrong on my medical bill, my only recourse right now is with the provider. All right, There's nobody else I can go to. There's nobody else I can complain to. Believe me, I tried. I sent complaints to the Attorney General's office for every one of those fraudulent bills. I heard nothing back. I sent complaints to the Health and Human Services Department. I heard nothing back. I sent complaints to the Texas Insurance Department. I heard nothing back. As a consumer, we have no recourse except to resolve this with our providers directly. And you know what? I was lucky my providers said, oh, sorry, our mistake. Here, we'll credit you the difference. What if they had said, no, sue me? They could very well do that. I don't have the money to finance a lawsuit against them over $350. <laughs> Certainly not worth it. Lawsuits can take years. There needs to be easier recourse. I think a great example of this is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which has jurisdiction over the banking center. If you catch any mistake on any statement anywhere, you can submit a complaint to the CFPB, and I tell you, I've done it before, it's like calling SEAL Team 6, all right? <laughs> they are all over that. I, I, I thought there was a mistake on my American Express statement the other day. Uh, well, not the other day, it was actually years ago. And I submitted a complaint to the CFPB. Man, they were on the phone with me within an hour. We're talking, it was an amount of 20-something dollars. And I was followed up with phone calls from American Express representatives trying to clear it up, and then they sent me a letter of apology and, of course, credited the difference. And why don't we have some kind of system like that for medical bills where 90% of them apparently contain errors? Also, the FTC needs to wake up and start pursuing collusive behavior claims against drug companies. And we need to re-examine our patent system. 
We are giving people an incentive to innovate. I agree with that. I agree with the patent system. All right? We are incentivizing people to come up with new ideas, potentially life-saving ideas. And their compensation for that is if you come up with this idea, you get 15 years of monopoly. But maybe if we give away this free 15 years of monopoly, we should have some kind of control in place to make sure that it's not abused if what is being patented is a life-saving medication. Right now, we don't have that. All right. That's the end of my talk. Thank you. post my spreadsheet on the private Facebook group. How's that Absolutely. sound? I'll delete all the pertinent medical information. <laughs> <laughs> but it can be a template people can use. Um, yeah, Patrick. Uh, my last point was a suggestion. Was talking about the fraudulent billing you got. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you tried this. Reported to the Postal Inspector's Office because if they mailed you that fraudulent bill, they can wow. a federal crime. I didn't think of that. You know, I have never been impressed with the Postal Service, but I'll try it. <laughs> Catherine? The CPT codes, is that on the internet? Is it standardized? Uh, yes, actually. So my insurer is Blue Cross Blue Shield, and Blue Cross Blue Shield on their website has a reference I can use to look up CPT codes with a description that says exactly what each code should be applied but to in that situation. Codes are standard across the, board. The, the The codes are from the American Medical Association. You can also sign up for an account on their website, and uh, they let you, I don't know why, they want you to buy a book, but you can look up up to five codes a day with their free accounts. <laughs> I just use the Blue Cross Blue Shield certain tool stuff. Um, a couple more questions, maybe? One more, maybe. One more question. All right. Um, I'm going to take you in the back. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm, this is a great pre presentation. I've been a long-term advocate of a single-payer Medicare for all. Um, but whenever I talk to some of my, I guess, more conservative friends or, or people who are on the other side about how we do healthcare in America versus how they do Canada, Western Europe, and one thing they always bring up is wait times, mm -hmm. and how uh, you know how you know you have an astronomical wait time in say Britain and France and, and Sweden, um, and you wouldn't have as much of a, of a wait time. Um, and again, I've, uh, my 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 response has always always been you know no, no system is perfect. It, I'm pretty sure Canada, Japan, and Western Europe are not without their problems. Uh, but that, that's something I always have a hard time. Yeah. I, mean, uh, I, I yeah. think you said it yourself, no system is perfect, right? So, yeah. There are, there are a bunch of different healthcare systems. Every country seems to do it a little bit differently, right? right? Some mix between private and public or strictly public, you know, how the reimbursements work, how they solve the issues of wait times and whatnot. Uh, there's a lot of things to play with there, but um, the bottom line is the way we're doing it is wrong. And it needs to be fixed. Thank you.